الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب إشرح لصدري ويسر لأمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ونعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We're continuing our Tafsir Ta'wil of Surah Al-Kahf and we left off last week at ayah number 16 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given inspiration to the Ashab Al-Kahf on what they should do and he said to them or he gave it to them in that form of inspiration and when you have disassociated yourselves from them, your people because they complained these people of ours have taken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, have taken others aside from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They follow other deities, they follow other philosophies, they follow other ideologies, they follow their own hawa, their desires. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when you have disassociated yourselves from them, now this is very interesting, it is a conditional statement. That the guidance I am going to give you is a unique guidance because you asked for a unique guidance. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahma from you, your mercy, your guidance. This unique guidance will only come about when you have separated yourselves from them. Their, their methodologies, their ideologies, their concepts, whatever it is, their systems, complete disassociation, ihtazala, separation from them. Wama ya'buduna illallah. Now the rhetoric in this statement is pretty, is pretty amazing. It's like saying whatever it is that they worship or whatever it is that they're doing, giving it no significance whatsoever. However astounding it might feel to your perspective. That subhanallah, look at what kind of things these people are doing. Allah is saying it's of no significance. They won't make it. They won't succeed in whatever it is that they are doing. He has already said it before, Surah Rahman. يَا مَعَشَرَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ إِنِ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ أَن تَنْفُذُوا مِنْ أَقْطَارِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَانْفُذُوا لَا تَنْفُذُونَ إِلَّا بِالسُّلْطَانِ You will not succeed except by my authority. So do whatever it is you want to do if you think you can make it. So he's saying وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Whatever it is that they are doing, doesn't matter. Just leave them. I'll deal with them. You need to do what you need to do. فَأَوِيلَ الْكَهْف Only then will I Lay out my mercy for you. Yanshur lakum rabbukum min rahmati. Allah is going to spread. Your Lord will spread for you from His mercy. Now, from this point onwards, the next one, two ayat. This is the, the heart of Ashab al kaf their tale. This is where the substance, the meat lies. And to go into this ta'wil, one really has to be open-minded because from a causality point of view or a linear point of view, you will only see a series of cause and effect. They wanted to run away, they fell asleep, they woke up, this happened, that happened. Allah has already said that this is not the, the thing, this is not the sign itself, right? Did you think that this was the sign of amazement from all our other signs? No, that's not what it is. There's something else here. What is happening with the Ashab al kaf is that there are two sets of occurrences. There are two things that are happen happening, taking place. One set of occurrences with regards to physicality, their biological selves, their bodies, the cave, the earth and then the second set of occurrences is with regards to their sleep, the state, their hal, their spiritual hal, in what state they were in, Con unconscious, subconscious, whatever state it is. I don't have the time to explain all these details and the actual, the, 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 the different states that a person can exist in and what it means. What does it mean when we sleep? Because sleep is a loose term and English is a loose language. Arabic is very specific. In the Arabic language, you can actually understand what it means when you sleep. What happens? Because from the conventional point of view, 
what modern science would tell you is that sleep is no big deal, it's just your body recuperating. Dreams are no big deal, it's just a series of neurological firings and images and things that you're seeing in your mind like a movie that's playing out. That's not what it is. Islamically, sleep is, 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 is part and parcel of your existent, or, or your existential experience. So you experience a dream. You're there, you're actually living it. You're just not living it in this world. So bear with me as I explain because I'm going to have to cut a few corners because of time. I can't really go into the details to explain the different theories behind this. وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا طَلَعَ التَّزَاوُرُ أَنْ كَحْثِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينَ وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِذُهُمْ ذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ He's saying, if you saw them, if you were there and you could see it, the sun, when it rose, تَزَاوَرُ أَنْ كَحْثِهِمْ When it rose, it would incline away from the cave, ذَاتَ الْيَمِينَ towards the right. وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِذُهُمْ ذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ and when it set, it would pass away from them. It would pass them by towards the left. Now the Quran is not a book of science, and yet it will give you scientific concepts. It's not a book of geology, it will give you geographical concepts. It is not a book of astronomy, it will give you astronomical concepts. This is the, the miracle of the Quran. It's a linguistic miracle. If, your fa if, you're the, if the sun is rising to your right and setting to your left, then that means you're facing north. That's cardinal co uh, orientation. What you deduce from this is that the cave that they were in, the mouth of the cave, the entrance of the cave was facing due north. So in the physical world, the geocentric world, or heliocentric, whatever your perception is, when the sun is rising, it's the rays of the sun that are tazawaru an kahfihim, that al yamin. They are shifting to the right. This is what the Quran is saying. When the sun is rising to the right, the, the rays of the sun are shifting away. And then when the sun is sh uh, setting, the rays are passing them by to the left. Wahum min fajwatin minhum, and while they were in that central space. Now, kahf compared to ghar, even though both mean cave, ghar is a smaller cave. Kahf is a cavern, it's big. And what the ulama say is, the mufassirin says that it was a big cave and they were not sleeping in the corners and the shadows, they were in the wide open space. This is part and parcel of the ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. Because the nourishment that their bodies received was purely, it, it's not the nourishment of food or ingestion, it's purely elemental from traditional science based on the five elements, fire, water, earth, air. That's the nourishment that their bodies received. So they were not hit by direct sunlight, the radiation or the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, but they received the, the, the nourishment of the sun that sustained their bodies while they were in that central space. Now he says, ذَلِكَ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ What does that mean? ذَلِكَ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ He's pointing to what was happening now in the other set of occurrences. Now when you sleep, the state that you enter into, your body stays where it is. But you enter into a different, for lack of a better term, dimension. And that's what dimension means in its technical use of the term, scientific use of the term. There are outer dimensions and then there are inner dimensions or outer dimensionality and interdimensionality. Outer dimensionality in Islamic cosmology is relative to the Samawat. The heavens, those are the outer dimensions, the stratas. The interdimensions are the inner partitions that Allah has placed on the earth in the material biological world. So we have the dimension of human beings. al hayawan is the animal dimension. And then we have the dimension of the jinn. And there is a gap in between. There is a veil in between. Then there is the dimension of the angels. And then there are other dimensions that we don't know of. One particular dimension that Ashab al-Kahf is pointing towards is the dimension of the Dajjal and it explains a lot of other things and I'll come to that inshallah. If you had seen them in their true state, so in the world of physicality you look at objects and forms, so their bodies, and you see that object and you see what it is. 
in the world of existentiality, you see a thing for what it really is. So what's really happening to them elsewhere? Right? Al-Kawnu Ma'ani Innam Al-Kawnu Innam Al-Kawnu Ma'ani Qa'imatun Bissur That indeed the world is meaning represented by objects, forms. So the meaning, the true meaning, something that it is and what it really is. That's what he's pointing towards. He's saying, ذَلِكَ min ayati. Min ayatillah. Not the actual sleep of 300 years, the bodies were there for 300 years, the cave and all those causal elements. No, where they really were. That is the sign. And the nature of a sign is that it always points to something else. A sign never points to itself. So this is what the Quran is telling you. Look at what the sign is and understand what it is relative to. The Prophet already made it clear that Surah Al-Kaf is directly connected to Dajjal. What is the connection? This is the connection. وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا تَلَعَ تَزَاوَرُ أَنْ كَهْفِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ When the sun was rising, it was inclining away from the cave to the right. This is not geocentric. Away from the cave to the right. وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِذُهُمْ ذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ When it was setting, it was setting, passing them by towards the left. This is not a geocentric model that we are accustomed to in the world of physicality. It is where they were in the other place. It is what the ulama define as a barzakh. Barzakh, it's not a physical location. Barzakh is a partition. It's a gap, a breach. In Christian theology, they call it purgatory. In our theology, we call it barzakh. It is a veil, bayn al-ard wa sama. A partition of timelessness, spacelessness between the, the earth and the samawat, the in-between. Timelessness, spacelessness meaning not in accordance to what we define space as physical distances or what we define time as a count of time. So there is a sense of timelessness that they experience there. And that is why in your dreams you will experience events for which you cannot account for either time or space. You will experience a stretch of events that might feel like they have occurred for years or only for a few minutes, whereas you have been sleeping for a specific period of time. Or space in the sense whereby you are defining the causality of physicality, right? You can fly, you can jump high, you can do all sorts of things. Because in that realm, you are now seeing the, the what they call uh, alam al-mithal, the, the world of images and exemplifications, the meanings themselves of the worlds. You're seeing it from the other side, for lack of a better term. You're looking at the world from the other side. If you were there, you would see it like this. وَهُمْ مِنْ فَجْوَةٍ مِنْهُمْ And they were in that space in between. Now, fajwa is also another interesting word. Fajwa means physical space. Fajwa also means gap or breach, which is synonymic to barzakh. That's, they were in that gap, in that breach. And in that gap, in that breach, you will experience three different kinds of dreams. If you are, depending on your spiritual state, depending on your hal, if you are a very spiritual person, you will rise closer to the samawat. You will receive good dreams, true dreams. If you are an earthly materialistic person, you will experience those kinds of dreams. And if your spiritual state is compromised, then you are vulnerable to the attack of the shayateen. That is where you will start getting nightmares, bad dreams, things that you really cannot you know, fathom. Um, Amr bin Uthman al-Malik said about the Ashab al-Kaf and why this has been chosen for them, why this hal specifically was chosen for them. He said, they said that thalathatun uh, min alamat al-awliya, there are three signs to those who are closest to Allah, the saints of Allah, awliya Allah. He says, arruju ila Allah fi kulli shayin, wal fakru ila Allah fi kulli shayin, wal... Uh, my handwriting is messed up here. He said the three signs of, uh, of awliya Allah are those who return to Allah in everything. Those who only place their trust in Allah in everything. And those who have utter complete dependency on Allah in all their affairs. And he said that the Ashab al-Kahf best exemplify these people. 
the awliya Allah. And because of that spiritual hal, this is the maqam that they have been given. This is their experience. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Dalika min ayatillah. That is the sign. Not the physical abode, not the fact that they slept and that they woke up and then this happened and that happened. No, those are not the signs. The actual sign is that I took them away. In this earthly realm, there is a partition where I took them to and then I sent them back. That they experienced another sense of reality. And in that experience, there was something unique and marvelous that took place. Because the ultimate test on Ashab al-Kaf was Kam labistum. How long did you sleep? That's the test that was given to them. How long? What was your perception of time? Did you understand what the time? This is why he said that it's not 300 years is not the point. We are amazed at 300 years of account. That's not the point. There is something else there. There is a different dynamic to a reality of time and perception of time that only a spiritual person will be able to experience. Because in the world that the Jal wants to create, the Jal wants to create a complete mechanical perception of time. And that indoctrination starts at a very early age. You wake up at a certain time, you eat breakfast at a certain time, you go to school at a certain time, you eat when you're told to eat, you go to the washroom when, you want to go, when you're allowed to go, you go home at a certain time, you sleep at a certain time. That is the mechanical indoctrination, that, that training that you're given from the age of four until you retire. And that, at that point, you can't even do anything else. You still continue with the same methodology. And that mechanical concentration of time takes you away from the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, I will only guide you once you have detached yourself from that. Once you have detached yourself from that world of causality, from that mechanical perception of reality. Now he describes their state as far as what they were in, in the physical cave, their bodies. So he's described what their hal was in the other place. What is their hal in, this, in the physical space? And if you were to see them, you would think, or you would come to the conclusion that they are awake, but instead they are asleep. Ibn Abbas said that, that, if, uh, that they, were, they were in a state of sleep where their eyes were open. Now, medically, this is, a, this, is, uh, this is a medical documentation that that person can be in such a state of existence with their eyes completely open. I believe they call it a vegetative state. Not a comatose state, it's more of a vegetative state. So it's, it's, there's a variance between the two where the eyes are open. وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ And we turn them to the left and to the right. Their bodies were turned. Ibn Abbas said that this turning um, kept their bodies nourished. It prevented, the, it prevented the earth from consuming them. Medically, this would be rel relative to ulcers and bed sores and uh, the dissemination of organs, uh, the gravitational effect on the bones and the, and the muscles and the tissues. And the same case was applied to the eye, according to Imam al Qutubi. He said that the eyes were kept open because it was necessary for the eyes to receive, to be aired out, because it would prevent the, the, the tissue of the eye from disseminating when it's closed the whole time. And the, their dog had stretched out its four legs. This is the ra'i, it's a, it's a unit of measurement had stretched out its four front legs. Bil Wasid, Ibn Abbas said that it's at the very threshold, right, right at the outside of the cave, not inside the cave. Now, this is very remarkable that every single causal effect in the physical abode was perfectly timed and with, with, with immense accuracy, precision. Nothing is accidental there. Everything was staged. Even so far as the dog is concerned, they say that the dog is, they met the dog on the way. And the dog spoke to them and asked them, don't be afraid of me. I am somebody who loves those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So I will accompany you and I will guard you. And the dog stayed as a guard outside the cave. 
And the reason why it was outside the cave was so that it would permit the angels to come into the cavern and turn their bodies and keep them nourished. This is why Allah is saying, is using the, the first person plural. وَنُقَلِّبُهُمْ We turned them to the left and to the right. لَوِ اتَّلَعَتَ عَلَيْهِمْ لَوَلَّيْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِرَارًا وَلَا مُلِئِتَ مِنْهُمْ رُعْبًا If you saw them, if you looked at them, you would, you would run and flee. You would run away. You would flee. It would fill you with terror. You see somebody sleeping for a half hour, one hour, no biggie. Someone slept for eight hours, still okay. Someone sleep for 12 hours, he's overslept, no problem. Someone is sleeping for 24 hours, now there's a big question mark. Someone slept for three days straight, that guy is probably dead. But someone is sleeping for years on end, their eyes wide open, they keep moving about, not a word out of their mouth. This is something that you can't fathom. You can imagine it, you can fantasize it, you can picture it. But if you are there, it's something that you cannot encompass. It is truly remarkable. Then he says, كَذَلِكَ بَعَثْنَهُمْ لِيَتَسَاءَلُوا بَيْنَهُمْ And likewise, we sent them back, that they may ask or question uh, between themselves. Now, كَذَلِكَ has got two denotations here, uh, connotations here. One kadalika is that, that the same process in which they had been caused to go to sleep is a reversal of the process. Likewise, the same way we made them to sleep is the same way we brought them. Now, this is very interesting. It's a reversal of process and a reversal of process also requires a reversal of time. In modern medical situations, when a person is being resuscitated or they're trying to bring that person back, they can't reverse the process. <clears throat> It's a forward progression. You have to keep doing it and keep going with it. So try to pump the heart or try to pump the uh, lungs or whatever it is. It's a forward procession. They cannot reverse the process. Time and the control of time ultimately is in Allah's hands. He said it himself in Hadith al-Qudsi, Ana ad I am eternity. Nobody can control time. Nobody can go back in time or go forward in time or go against time other than the way they have been created to go. It's very interesting because when you look at modern developments, all this anti-aging and, uh, you know, the whole youthful process, it's, it's a concept that insinuates or, or speaks towards the reversal of a process that Allah has already ordained in a forward direction. And he's saying that only I can bring it back that way. And the second connotation of Qadalika is that it's not a big deal. It's very easy for him to do it. وَكَذَلِكَ Just like that, he brought them back. It's not that difficult for him to do it. بَعْثَ وَبَعْثْنَهُمْ بَعْثَ is بَعْثَ means to send. بَعْثَ يَبْعَثُ He sent, he sent or he's sending. And the concept here is that a person who is brought back to life, resurrection, which is the end definition of the term, بَعْثَ, resurrection. From our point of view, a person comes back to life. But from the other point of view, the other side, he is sent back into the world of the living. That's what Ba'atha means. He sends them back into the world of living. He takes your soul and if he has ordained death, he keeps it. If not, he sends them back. So they question themselves, themselves Qala qailun, say the speaker amongst them, minhum, kam labistum. This is the zenith. This is why they had been, the whole thing was staged for them to ask this particular question. How long did you remain? He didn't ask how long did you sleep? He asked how long did you remain? Yani, how long did you stay in that state that you were in? That state of existence. Because sleep is also a state of existence. You experience reality through sleep. And they said, لَبِثْتَ قَالُوا لَبِثْنَا يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْدَ يوم. Either a day or a part of a day. Bar the yom is a part of a day that's less than a half in measurement. So a day or just a small portion of the day. Most likely from the point of view would be maybe a, a couple of hours, two, three hours. Six, seven, eight hours is usually a quarter of a day. That's a, that's a regular sleep. So ba, uh, yom and aw ba the yom, a day or part of a day. Now this is highly, highly important. This particular piece here, because the Prophet said 
that Dajjal will have 40 days. He said, يَوْمُكَ sana, يَوْمُكَ shahar, wa يَوْمُكَ jum'ah." And he separated the first three days from the rest of the days. And he said, a day that's like a year, a day that's like a month, and a day that's like a week. Yawm, in the conventional use of the term, when we say yawm or we say day, we think 24 hours. Now remember, the Quran is forcing you to break linearity of perception. Break your linearity or your mechanical count of time. Think in existential terms. Yawm is a period of time, a stretch of time, whose exact quantification cannot be known because time in its inherent nature is not a quantitative element. It is a qualitative element. Time cannot be quantitative. You cannot rationalize it. You cannot accumulate it. You cannot measure it. You can't put it in a beaker or a box and say, I have this much time in here. It's not tangible. It, the only thing we can associate with time is a counting of time. So when we say 24 hours, we have just partitioned it. We're just counting it. It's a count of time, a measure of time. So, the, the relative here is that a period of time that in proportionality is like a year, feels like a year. Kasana. It's not a year. There are people who actually sit and count 365 plus 30 plus 7 plus 37. The child is going to be for one year, three months and so and so weeks. So we'll wait and see when that happens. No, it says kasana. It's like a year. A period of time that is stretched out to perception as long as a year. So your perception of a year is a long stretch period of time. And then Ashab al kaf is saying, Yawm aw ba'da yawm, a part of a day. A stretch of, of time that's just this much in relation to a physical count of time that's 300 years. So if a small portion of time is equivalent to 300 years, then an entire yawm can stretch on for a thousand years. Why not? As the Quran says, that a day to Allah is like a thousand years. Is it so much difficult to understand that the first day of the Jal is close to a thousand years or plus? And the second day of the Jal is probably less than that, a proportionality of that. The ratio of a month to a year, and then the ratio of a week to a month. And the rest of his days are like your days. The rest of his days are like your physical count of 24 hours. It's at the, 30, it's at the third day that he makes his khuruj, that he comes out from the other side. Okay. This break, this, this concept of time and this concept of dimensionality, these two elements, and by the way, this is theoretical. This is not mutawatir. These are, most of it is my own deductions, along with scholarly um, works that I have used to build the whole theory together as evidential weight. But it is theoretical, and it's not the thing that is applied. It is the thing that allows one to understand other elements. It allows one to understand the hadith of Tamim Uddari, for example. Tamim Uddari and a group of sailors went out on a voyage. They encountered a storm and they ended up on an island where they met at Dajjal. A lot of rational scholars, rationalists, have tried to decipher this hadith and they conclude with, you know, it's a problematic hadith. But it's not problematic. When you put things in perspective, it's not problematic. We can, it cannot be problematic because the Prophet said it. It's the truth. The problem is you not understanding it. So when you put things into perspective, the hadith is not problematic. It's your understanding of it. But it allows us to understand how such a thing occurs. How did they meet the job chained up at that point in time? How was he able to relate with events happening in our world? and be able to say, then my time is coming soon. How everything that has occurred since the Prophet's time, the developments in the West, all the different agendas, the Crusades, the, the, the different revolutions and eras and ages, 
of the Renaissance, the scientific age that they call the age of enlightenment, the industrial age, how all these things have come about, it then starts to make sense that there is some sort of a connection here. Because when you look at the world as it is being set up today, none of it is used for good. It's not used for good. Ultimately, it's all being used for some sense of a fitna or some sense of a facade. And the people who are benefiting from it are not the Muslims. They are not the people who are following the Book of Allah. It's not designed for our benefit. It's designed for their benefit. We can go on on that subject, but uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail next time when we get a chance. Now, here they say, Qalu rabbukum a'lamu bima labith, bima labithum. Your Lord is the one who knows how long you tarried. So stop speculating. Was it 300 years? Was it 350 years? Was it in 1942? Was it in which year? Stop speculating. فَبْعَثُوا أَحَدَكُمْ بِوَرِكِكُمْ Take بِوَرِكِكُمْ هَذِهِ Send one of you with this silver coin. This I have questioned many times. Why this particular phrase? What is the significance of this silver coin? It's a definite article. This silver coin. Not just any silver coin. I came to a conclusion and I'll, I'll tell you what the conclusion is and you tell me if it makes sense. إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ To the city. And again, why the city? Why al Medina? Why not Qarya? Why not a village? Why to the city? فَلْيَنْذُرْ أَيُّهَا أَزْكَ تُعَامًا فَلْيَأَتِيكُمْ بِرِزْكٍ مِّنْهُ And let him look for the purest of food and let him bring provision for you from that. وَلْيَتَلَطَّفْ وَلَا يُشِعْرَنَّ بِكُمْ أَحَدًا And be very careful that they don't even have a sense they don't catch your scent. They don't figure out who you are. إِنَّهُمْ أَنْ يَذْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ يَرْجُمُوكُمْ أَوْ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ وَلَنْ تُفْلِهُ إِذًا أَبَدًا If they come to find out who you are, they will stone you or kill you. يَرْجُمُوكُمْ They will destroy you. أَوْ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ Or they will convert you to their ways. They will impose their ideologies on you. They will push you to their agendas. And once that happens, وَلَن تُفْلِهُ إِذَنْ abada, You will never succeed. There is no way that you are going to succeed from that point onwards. This particular coin and this particular... The concept of Medina, from the Islamic point of view, Medina is one of the derivatives of the word Deen or Dana. It has the same root basis of Islam as a Deen and Medina being the city that follows that deen. So there is an establishment of civility, of the Sharia, of, of everything else, the infrastructure, the educational system, taking care of the old and young and sick, the healthcare systems, all those systems are part and parcel of the deen. They are subsidiary tertiary elements, where the primary are the aqidah and the person's iman and those all. The secondary elements are the concept of building civility, which is the imara, one of the purposes of mankind is cultivation that we have been sent on earth to cultivate the world, to cultivate our existence here. So that's the Islamic point of view and the growth of the metrop metropolitan comparatively. If you look at, if, if, you, if you were to let's say look at the world from the outside, from outer space, if you, if you do a Google search and look at the maps and you see the growth of the metropolitan regions. It looks like kama. It's like a, like a cancer, like a, like an infection that is spreading out on the land. It looks like a facade that has destroyed the green landscape. That's literally what it looks like. This concept of the metropolitan is something that is part and parcel, or we have identified as part and parcel of the Jal's plan, because everything is in the metropolitan. Your entire dependency is in the metro metropolitan. Your food, your sustenance, your education, your well-being, your health care, it's all in the metropolitan. There's maybe a 1% of the world's population really that is not reliant on the metropolitan in one way or another, directly or indirectly. People who actually grow their own food and do their own health care and they actually just live by themselves, cutting off the grid, so to speak. 
So sending this person to the metropolitan to find food, this is important because this is directly related to our age. Look for food that is purest of all and take your provision from there. And that's all you need to do as far as the Metropolitan is concerned, according to the directive of the Quran. Be careful that they don't find out who you are or they will turn you and convert you to their ways. وَكَذَلِكَ عَثَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٌّ وَأَنَّ السَّعَةَ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا And then just like that, we caused them to be discovered. And this is where I associated the coin, the silver coin. Now historically, some scholars say that they were discovered because of their, uh, of their dress and their attire. It was something that was out of fashion, out of, you know, three centuries ago that fashion goes out. So it raises question marks, what kind of people are these? To me, I didn't see that as a plausible explanation because in those times, it was not like fashion was so widespread as comparatively today where a trend is ongoing constantly and it's constantly changing. You look at somebody who was from the 50s wearing 50s, uh, 50s suit, then you begin to question what's wrong with this fellow. But what they used to do historically is that when an emperor, when the Roman emperor, uh, a new emperor came into power, the treasury, the federal reserve treasury would recollect the old coinage and, and, and stamp new coins with the new emperor's face on. And that was what would be brought into circulation. So when you're looking at a three century variance, that is what betrayed them. That's how they were discovered because they had a currency that was not in circulation at the time. So it raised a lot of questions. This particular coin, وَرِقِكُمْ هَذِهِ This particular coin, it really puts into perspective that it's money that actually betrayed them. Oh, لِيَعْلَمُ حَقٌ That they, they may know, the people may know and the Ashab al-Kaf may know that the promise of Allah is true. وَأَنَّ السَّعَةَ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا And the hour, concerning the hour, there is no doubt, there is no raiba. That the hour is certain. Now, as sa'a, there are two kinds of sa'a. There is sa'atul kabira and sa'atul saghira. The greater hour and the lesser hour. The greater hour is in relative to the end of time, right? End of humanity. And the lesser hour is in relative to every individual. It is dead certain that you will die. And there's no doubt about it. And then there were people who were disputing amongst themselves regarding the Ashab al-Kaf. They were in constant disputation, speculation, because after that, according to the ulama, Allah, once they were discovered, Allah caused them to die now permanently. So the people were disputing and, and arguing amongst themselves. Who are they? What should we do? You know, what should, how should we go about things? فَقَالُوا ابْنُ عَلَيْهِمْ بُنْيَانًا There are some of them who say that build over them a structure. And this is another interesting concept. The, historically, some ulama say that the Ashab al-Kaf were of Christian origin. That they were, they, were, they were Christians. And at that time, it was Byzantium Christian. Uh, Greek Christians at that time. In the region of Anatolia, which is where the Christian legend comes from. The sleepers of Ephesus, they call them. And Ephesus was the town or the city where they were. So, now this is also very interesting because if you look at the modern structure of governance today, the entire structure, the secular system of governance is, if it is republican, it is based off the Roman system. If it is democratic, it's based off the Greco system, the Greeks. And these were the two dominant powers of the Western world. From them, we have the Greco-Roman ideology or ideologies, and which is then later translated into the Judeo-Christian. Because the, the early Hellenistic Greeks at the time of Nabi Isa accepted Judaism, but a Judaism that recognized Nabi Isa as a Nabi. And then the later Roman Catholics who split in 1054 became the Western Roman Empire and, 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 and Roman Catholic Christians. Um, they adapted the Roman system of their way of life. And 
part and parcel of their paganistic side because they try to create some sort of a compromise. The, the most of the Christians try to create some sort of a uh, an, an ease to help the pagans convert to Christianity because they felt that if they had the Roman Empire on their side, then the Christianity could spread much easily. Islam never did that. There's a very clear variance in Asira that Islam never compromised to allow certain external components to come in. Let us celebrate our holidays as well, you see. So a lot of things that the Christians practice like Christmas and Easter and Halloween and, and whatever not, it actually comes from pagan origins. These are things that were brought in externally. And whatever similarity was seen between the two, they meshed them together. So Christmas as the birth of Jesus Christ is not actually the birth of Jesus Christ. But because on the 25th of September, uh, December, the, the pagan Rome celebrated the, the, the birth of the sun god whom they worshipped. And because the Christian narrative then translated the Hebrew into their own Latinization and called him the son of God. So they meshed the two together. That's why you have got the 25th of Christmas. But another thing that they used to do is when it came to the commemoration of saintly people, their tradition was to build a monument. And this is something evident you will see in, in modern culture, modern secular culture. If you go to, I've never been to the United States, but um, in Washington, D.C., for example, they've got the Statue of Liberty. They've got the uh, Washington Monument. They've got the Lincoln Monument. They've got the Jefferson Monument. So whoever they deemed as somebody worthy or saintly or godly or somebody of veneration, they built a monument. This is where that ideology comes from. So some of them said, let's build them a monument. قَالَ الَّذِينَ غَلَبُوا عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِمْ لَنَتَّخِدَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ مَسْجِدًا They are those who prevailed over them, the righteous ones. They said, no, 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 no. If you really want to commemorate them, let's build a masjid in their honor, a place of worship. Now, Muslims have this ideology that Muslim, masjid only belongs to them. Masjid, yes, insofar as our places of worship, we call them masjid. Because in the Arabic, the meme is a meme that is used in morphology to create a maf'ul. A, a proper noun, the place where the action is performed or the person who performs the action. So, amana is belief, faith, right? And you morph, morph it using the meme, you get mu'min, the one who believes. So, masjid comes from sajda. The actual form of worship is sajda, you perform sajda. And the place where the sajda is performed is the masjid. That's the meme right there. And this is, this, the sujda is, from our tradition, the sujda is the heart of the salah. If you look at all the ab other Abrahamic faiths, their form of worship is very similar, especially the Orthodox. They actually do their worship in a very similar way. The one thing that doesn't change is the sujda. So whatever sharia they had been given and whatever stipulations they had been given, they perform their worship accordingly. But the sujda has never changed. So Nabi Dawood also did sajda. Nabi Sulaiman also did sajda, which is why in the previous surah, Surah Isra, Allah starts by saying, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi layla min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. Right? So even that is called a masjid, not because it was built by Muslims, but because it's a place where they did sajda. And this is something that's part and parcel of Muslims, which really needs to be changed. You know, we hold this sense of arrogance that we are the only rightly guided ones and we only have, we are the only ones with the true uh, knowledge. And it's, it's an arrogance that the Jews had. And unfortunately, we're developing the same thing. That's just khair, uh, almost done anyway. سَيَكُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةٌ رَابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ وَيَكُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ سَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ رَجْبًا بِالْغَيْبِ وَيَكُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ قَالُوا قُلْ, قل رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا كَلِيلًا فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَارًا إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِي فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا This is where the speculative elements now start in. People speculating there were, there were four, their door goes fifth. And Sayakulu is a future denotation from that point of revelation. So this is something that people have continually been doing. That there were four, the dog was fifth, or there were five, the dog was sixth. They are just speculating about the unseen. Rajman bil ghaib. Wayakuluna sabatun wa thaminuhum. There were seven, and their dog was eighth. Say, 
my Lord, a'lamu bi'iddatihim. Only Allah knows what their exact number was. Ma ya'lamuhum illa qalila. And this is an interesting statement because when the Jews were given this, this response, they, they, it really hurt them. When, when the Jews asked about the ruh, وَيَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحُ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيتُمْ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَّا قَلِيلٍ You don't have any knowledge of this except very little. And the same answer is being given here. مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٍ You have no knowledge of this except very little. This really is something that they couldn't digest. And they actually opposed the Prophet about it. And it's also interesting because the Jews came with an agenda that was essentially asking the Prophet or telling him indirectly, rhetorically, that, you know, what's your response? And if it agrees with what we know or what we believe, then we will accept you. Otherwise, there's really nothing for us to discuss. This arrogance that I was talking about is the same arrogance that Muslims have. It's very ironic because you meet these different, different sects and the first question they'll ask you, bro, what's your aqidah? Brother, what's your aqidah? If, if your aqidah doesn't match mine, there's nothing for us to talk about. And they know themselves. I'm not going to name the sects. It's very ironic because the very Jews who are using this arrogance on our Nabi, we've got all these different sectarians who are now forming ties with these same Jews, the same people. They have the same arrogance. They were asking the Prophet, what's your aqidah? If it doesn't match ours, we don't know who you are. And these same individuals are doing the same thing because they'll ask their own Muslim brothers, what is your aqidah? If it doesn't match ours, we, are no, we have nothing to talk about. But they're there forging ties, normalizing relations. I saw an article this morning about uh, Netanyahu and, uh, and Muhammad bin Zayed being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. I said, this is, this is amazing. I mean, this is the level of stupidity that humanity has reached at this point. It's like giving Donald Trump the award for being the most honest politician over the last four years. That's the level that they are at. And it's also ironic that the same that you're normalizing ties with the same people who have insulted your Nabi for the last 1400 years and have insulted Nabi Isa for the last 2000 years and have killed every other Nabi that was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It questions your aqidah because your aqidah says, Amantu billahi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi. We believe in his messengers. Where does that belief go? Is it just superficial? Because you're making friendship and alliances with the same people who have killed those messengers because it, they didn't agree with their aqidah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear. Whosoever joins them, whosoever forges alliances with them, is indeed one of them. Allah is not going to guide a people who do such kind of injustices to themselves and to his religion and to his Nabi. So these are the speculators. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً Don't argue about these components. إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Except an evident argument, except its substantial argumentation. If you've got something solid to put on the table that makes sense, then go into that deduction or induction or whatever logic you're going to apply there. But don't get into a speculation. How many were there? Did they sleep like this? Did they have blankets? Did they eat before they went to sleep? Did they pray salah? Those are all speculations. وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُ أَحَدًا And do not inquire about them from anyone else. Now, the reason why this, the way the surah was revealed, um, according to the seerah, when the Quraysh came back and asked the questions, the Prophet ﷺ said that um, he's going to give them the answer the next day because he had hoped that he will receive revelation. But according to the seerah, he did not say, Insha'Allah. That's not the Prophet ﷺ did not say, Insha'Allah. And so the revelation was delayed for a few days since so the Quraysh then started mocking them because the Jews had said if he can answer them that was the condition if he can answer these questions then he is a prophet if he is not then do whatever you want to do with him so it's actually proving them right and the prophet was concerned about this 
So the first of the revelations, according to some of us, in that these two ayahs were the first ones that came and were almost done. وَلَا تَقُلَّنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ حَقَدَ Do not do anything, do not say of anything that, you know, indeed I will do that tomorrow. But, uh, don't, don't make the declaration that I will do something. إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Except that Allah is going to will it. وَاذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَصِيتَ وَقُلْ عَسَى أَنْ يَحْدِيَانِ رَبِّي لِأَقْرَبَ مِنْ هَذَا رَشَدًا And remember your Lord when you forget and say, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Lord, is going to guide me in something as close or closer to the truth, to the right. وَلَبِثُوا فِي كَحْفِهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةِ سِنِّينَ Sinina was Dadu Tis'a. Now, in the finality, in the close of the surah, of that story, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, okay, as far as their physical abode is concerned, they stayed in the cave. Thalatha mi'atin sinina, 300 years. Was Dadu Tis'a and add nine. And he's giving you both the count of time. He's giving you the lunar count and he's giving you the solar count. 300 years, solar is, and, uh, is 309 years, lunar. 100 years, one century, one solar century is equivalent to 103 years of Luna. He's giving you both and it doesn't really matter. He's saying it right there. Kuli Allahu a'lamu bima labithu. Say, only Allah knows how long they really remained. This is how long they remained, what it is, how long they really remained, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Lahu ghaybas samawati wal ard. With him are the unseen of the heavens and the earth. Absur bihi wa asmir. How clear his sight and how clear his hearing. Ma lahum min dunihi min waleen wa la yushriku fi hukmihi ahada. And there is none for them, any other protector besides him, nor does he share his legislation with anybody. It was a bit longer than I anticipated, but I wanted to finish that particular section so that we can carry on into the next section. Inshallah, which is now going into the rest of Surah Kaf. Are there any questions? No? Or afterwards? Whenever you come across any questions. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'un alim wa tub alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawabur rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin barakallahu feekum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.